All right, let's get started. I would like to welcome everyone, um, most importantly, the gentleman in the committee. And I would like to present my PhD dissertation here, uh, which was called Compiler Tuning Using Machine Learning. My name is Amir Ashuri, and my advisor were uh, Cristina Silvano, uh, Gianluca Palermo, and John Gavazos uh, in the University of Delaware, uh, whom I had the chance to work with him um, for like seven months in the year 2014 and 15. All right. So this is going to be the high level outline of my dissertation. At first, uh, I'll introduce the motivation and the description of the problem. And I'll have a quick review on the state of the art. Then I'll jump to the major problems of compiler optimization which uh, are called the, the selection problem and the phase ordering problem. At the end, we're going to have a quick discussion and the conclusion. So let's get started. So I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with uh, the compiler. So if you want to have a look at the compiler as a black box, so compiler is a, is a module in between the, uh, the application side and the hardware side so that we input the source code and it's going to transform it in a way that the machine or the chip uh, beneath it can understand the binary code. Um, so we have different compilers in different OS systems. If we zoom in to that compiler module, we're going to have certain layers. So, uh, so starting from the top, we're going to start from the high level language which can be either C, C++, or any C family language, or Fortran, and then we're going to have some front end, checking some <coughs> syntaxes and semantics, and then going down to some middle end, or in some compiler framework, uh, it's so-called the IR. So we have some optimizations in this level, and then we go to the back end, where the actual code is generated. And then at the output, we're going to have the assembly code. So what we are interested in, instead of going to the back end, which needs the compiler knowledge, the compiler design knowledge, we want to stay mostly in front end and the, the middle end and use those available optimization to generate better <coughs> assembly codes. So how? As an example, I put a very small um, loop here. So this is going to be our normal loop here. So we we'll loop over the x. 400 times and we're going to delete it. So, loop unrolling, which is a, uh, one of the famous uh, transformations, allows us to unroll the loop and instead of having to uh, loop over that variable 400 times, we're going to make it smaller to uh, 20, 20 times. So, like five times smaller. So, the order in which the loop was going on is going to be reduced. So this is helpful in this situation for us, so we can save some <coughs> operations. And if we wanted to, if we didn't have, for instance, any interdependencies between uh, our loop or what is so-called loop carry dependency, we could just make it in parallel. Another example uh, might be a loop tiling. So here, instead of looping over these two dimension, which we have for i and j. And at the end, when we go on both dimensions, we're going to end up having some cache problems, cache misses, and memory locality problems. We can tie it with two, multiply two blocks. So after tiling, we're going to be going tile by tile, and then we can use more of the <coughs> locality of the memory. So in this case, it will be helpful for us. But the most important things about having transformation or compiler optimization is the word optimization is a misnomer. So at some point when we apply optimization, we're going to end up having a worse code or that can perform much worse than it was before. So after this, I just wanted to point out why we need compiler optimization at all. So nowadays we have so many families of the uh, computing systems. So if you want to uh, classify it, you can have like uh, low power stuff, which mostly we have in embedded board, or high performance, 
which we have in HPC domain. So for each of them, different goals are intended to have. So for HPC, we, we need to have higher performance, and for mobile and embedded system, we are interested in having to control the area issues and the power issues. And also, on the other hand, compilers like GCC and LVM are giving us certain standard optimization like OS, which is targeting the code size, or OX, which X can be one, two, three, or at some cases can be four. It's going to uh, optimize our code size or the execution time. Also, OFAS, which, which is only targeting uh, performance. So that's why we need compiler optimization in different scenarios and in different hardwares. So, as Mike O'Boyle mentioned uh, in his, one of his presentations in 2004, so compilation can be more or less, um, can be called as translation, more or less. I didn't put the equal sign because we can add some more stuff after that. So this piece of code is taken from the two uh, multiplication in the polybench application. So this is the exact loop. And these are the ACC uh, pride mods you're going to see. So this is exactly the, the, the hex dump of the assembly code that I generated from this. I mean, the, I know that we don't have any one-to-one -one line from hex to uh, source code. Definitely the lines are changing. But just for the sake of being uh, correct, so uh, the line 81 is exactly 520 in the X word, X decimal. So this is the exact chunk if we were to have a one-to-one. -one. So you see, we have a translation of this code to this um, hex decimal or assembly file. But to be politically correct, compilation is exactly translation plus optimization. So while we translate, we can optimize as well. And this will lead us, suppose, if we had the first optimization, as I mentioned before, like loop and rolling, so we're going to have this chunk of binary assembly. What if, if we had another optimization like um, loop tidying that I've already shown to you? This will lead us another assembly. What if I had combined these two together? So at first I was using loop tidying and then loop and rolling. What is if I have? Uh, what if I had so many other optimizations in combination? So like five, six, or even ten of them together. So you see, we have more and more different version of the same code that it was sounded very easy for us to run within the hardware. In fact, I would like to tell you know that let you know that it's more than that. It's like in the order of ten, order of thousand, hundred, and millions. So it's a lot. So at the end, what are we going to do with this? We're going to be end up in billions of gigantic words of different transformed area. This is the last one for this guy. So as I mentioned, so we can simply generate many billions of different translation for a same simple source code. So at the end, which one we have to choose? And this is exactly what we're going to tackle here. As you see here, compilers, the recent compilers like LVN, GCC, or Intel ICC are giving us each of them around 100, 20, 250, and 75 different optimizations. So you can take a look at them or infer them as some parameters that you can simply switch on and off. And as I mentioned already, these are, are giving us certain, uh, you know, benefits like performance and code size. Okay, this exactly leads us to the first major problem I wanted to tackle. So first, if you only take into account the, the problem of selecting certain of those compiler flags as enable or disable, we're going to end up having the selection problem. So we have several compiler passes that for, they form a vector of optimization. And we simply want to know whether to apply each of those or not. As an example, so we have five. So let n is equal to five optimization. Loop and rolling, tiling, DCE, which is dead code elimination, loop fusion, and mem2 register. 
So we can have this sub variety of them. So either we can apply only loop fusion and the others are off, or DCE and loop fusion. So at the end, you're going to be ending up in a space of binary, which is exponential. So and it's going to be to the uh, it's going to be expon uh, exponentiated to the n, <coughs> which is the number of optimizations we have. So in this case, we had five optimizations on and off. This is a simplified version of the selection problem, and we're going to end up having 32 different parameters as our design space. Okay, let's go for an extended version of the, the selection problem. So we have the same problem, but instead we have both optimizations and certain optimization level for some of them. For instance, we could have certain optimization level for unrolling or tiling, as I've already mentioned, two by two. This will expand the problem a little bit. So we can have, for instance, loop unrolling um, like to the factor of three or tiling two, two by two. And then this will expand the problem to the exponential space of n while we have m optimization level. So in this case, we're going to be having, instead of 32, it's going to be expanded to 72. So let's go, let's put one step further. Now, within this problem, if we consider the phases and the repetition of the optimization, we're going to be end up having the phase ordering problem as it's been already defined at late 70s. So it's a problem that we don't have any definite answer for that. That's why I put no ideal ordering of phases, because if you don't confine the bound of your optimization vector, it's going to carry on expanding like 5, 10, 100, and 1,000. So we won't have any ideal ordering of the phases, because there is no bound for that. And applying optimization A and then optimization B on top of that can obliterate the effect that optimization A could have been done, or again, vice versa. So this will lead us to a much huger space. So let N as the old five optimization. So in this case, we're going to have DCE and loop unrolling change their position. So that first we had loop unrolling, then DCE. Now we're going to have DCE and loop unrolling. In this case, and the rest, that's why I put these dots here, because it's going to expand. We don't have any boundaries on that. In this case, the omega or the, the space for the phase ordering will expand to factorial space, which is much larger than exponential space. So in this case, for instance, we're going to have 120. Taking one step further, making it a little bit harder, and taking into account the length of the optimization and enabling repetition. This will lead us to the nightmare that we are dealing with within the compiler optimization community. So we can, what if I have two loop unrolling next to each other as a repetition of loop unrolling? What if I had two DCEs? So what's going to happen to this? As you see, this will lead an extended version of the problem, which I call phases, including repetition, and the variable lens. So at some point, you're going to have a lens of three. At some point, you're going to have a lens of five. So in this case, you have to count them lens by lens from the lens one to the n to the m, which m could be any maximum you are um, desired to work with. In this case, if you put m as five, so we're going to see that for a very simple, I'm sorry, this is five. So for a very simple problem, we're going to have a thousand different design spaces. So suppose if you go to Elvian board and you have hundred of them and you put like hundred as your maximum boundary, it's going to expand to millions and billions of different optimization, which any of them can lead to a separate transform version. So after all this, let's take a look at the state of the art in a nutshell. So what the researchers have been doing. Starting from the introduction of compiler, which was the late 40s, after the Second World War. So in, at 70s, they started to realize that when, when we do compilation, we can apply transformation on that. So there are optimization involved, and there is a problem 
which can be which can be called a phase ordering. They could make some analogies with other problems. For instance, nowadays we have gene sequencing as well. So in genetic science, so this is more or less the same. Um, but gene sequencing has an advantage which you have a fixed boundary of 23, if I'm not wrong. I'm not an expert on that field. But here we don't have any boundaries on the numbers, so it's going to be even more harder. So it's even harder than an MP hard problem. So at 80s, they started to apply non iterative approaches, like manual back end approaches, in order to understand different phases and apply uh, certain optimizations to alleviate this problem. At 90s, iterative compilation started. So this gentleman was one of the pioneers of them in late 90s. So uh, they started to introducing iterative compilation, which is the compilation of the same code and choosing the best regarding the scenario we have that satisfies certain op uh, objectives. And then after 2000, when we got to know more application characterization features, like getting more features from the source code, getting more features from the IR, or getting more features from the dynamic code while it's running, so we can generate a better understanding of the same application, and at the same time, by the advancement of machine learning techniques, we could induce better and more accurate models, and we could apply multi-objective optimizations to filter certain Pareto points like that satisfy the power, the area, and the performance. And that's exactly lead us to where we are, so as they call the tuning era. So, autotuning, if you want to have a quick definition for that, autotuning, or simply stands for the word automatic tuning, is addressing automatic code generation, also automatic code optimization, and it can apply, um, it can be used of certain scenarios in order to maximize or minimize certain objectives for us. And Historically, in the 90s and 80s, the auto-tuning was, I mean, if, they, if you could call them auto-tuning, it was done in the back-end, but the downside of having some back-end optimization is every time you want to apply the optimization, it's going to be costly, so you have to have exclusive knowledge of compiler designer, and the overhead will be higher because you have to change the back-end rather than playing with the parameters in the IR or the front-end. As a very quick review of the breakthrough papers in the field. So, as I mentioned, the introduction of learning methods of non-iterative compilation started in the late 70s and the 80s, and um, you know, the first five years of the 90s. Then Cooper started to apply genetic algorithm on the design space. So there are some certain papers that stands out. I put them here. The first time Somebody wanted to tackle the phase ordering problem. It was Kulkarni in 2004 and Cavazos and Kulkarni in 2012. The first time iterative compilation was introduced, as I mentioned, was uh, Budin and uh, the other guys in Edinburgh, uh, of course, Erwin. Uh, and 2006, they mastered the work with the machine learning uh, model. And this is right now the most cited paper of the field. So the first time this application characterization was coming to place was by Cavazos and EJ Park. And lately, we have done a small contribution to this uh, auto tuning era by applying optimization groups and Bison network, which I'll jump into it in, um, shortly. All right, so if you take a look at my uh, dissertation, we have on the chapter two, we have classified and provided the holistic organization of a survey on the field. So we have been classifying it by different characteristic technique, different machine learning methods, different prediction type, different optimization space, and the target domain. So since I, I'm not going to have time, I'm just, you know, uh, jump over it and finish this chapter with the dissemination uh, slide. So we've already uh, submitted this survey to XM Transaction on Computer Survey and it's 
under review by the name of Survey and Compiler with Unique Using Machine Learning. And these were my co-authors. The first two were my colleagues. And of course, John was my advisor in the University of Delaware. And these two gentlemen are my advisor in Polini. All right, so let's, now that we know the problem, we know what's been going on in the past 40 years, let's just wrap up what I've been doing in the past four years. So, I have done it through, um, I've classified with two different methods, the, se the selection problem and also the phase ordering problem. So, the selection problem, I've approached it with two different methods, design space methods or machine learning methods. So, if you want to go for design space, we provided a framework that starts from architectural parameters and we did a hardware software co-design approach. At first, we, um, we fixed the micro-architectural parameters and then we applied the compiler or the tuning phase on top of that. Using a statistical analysis, we end up uh, limiting certain compiler flags so that it can be of use for researchers. So, on that, Methodology we use VLIW. Um, since I don't have um, time, I'm not going to jump. I mean, explain much. But VLIW has been a very successful architecture for embedded devices since it can alleviate the the complexity from hardware to the compiler side. That's why it's a very good test bed for compiler with Unity. All right. But the downside, as I explained, we need to expose it to greater compl uh, compiler complexity in order to have better performance. All right, in order to do that, we apply the famous roof line model introduced by University of Berkeley, so which is defining the boundary for us in the computational world. So it's gonna define the performance and throughput. So whatever system we have, either we're gonna end up in the boundary of memory, or if we pass that one, we're going to end up in the peak performance. So no matter if we, so if we change the, the architecture of the CPU, this line will go higher. If you change the architecture of the memory or the cache hierarchy, this line will go higher. But nevertheless, we're going to be confined in this roof line model. As a, as a small experimental setup, we ran 4,000 times one compiler optimization. I think it was loop and rolling. And I'm not quite sure if you can see, it. there are two different uh, colors, so red and blue. So the red was the disactivation of the same compiler flag, and blue was the activation of that. So you see, regarding this model, we are interested in going that way to reach the boundary of our roof line. And each of the parameters are defined as follows. All right, so that was the whole architecture. Uh, that, that was the whole methodology. So on the left side, we started to run our BSC engine and end up using our VLW simulator and we clustered into four different clusters. Four is arbitrary, we just wanted to have four as four families of clusters, so optimized clusters. And then on the right side, so this one, we started our compiler transformation exploration. So if you go left, the first one, the flow was, yeah, we started the exploration, we, we did the parameter filtering with this satisfaction of the objective, so this objective should be minimized. And then we did the clustering. Using these clusters, we found four champions for each of the clusters. And then using those four champions, we could start applying our compilation flow, which will end up at the end using certain statistical analysis, certain compiler optimizations in which when we apply, we can see easily that the two distributions, which is here colored as red and sort of blue, is called for disactivation and activation of certain compiler flag. So if, if we apply this test, we understand if the median of these two distributions have had certain effect um, the metrics here it was, for instance, intensity and performance. So that was the four clusters I was mentioning. We just named them arbitrary as 
low and high, so low stands for low power, high for high performance, so the final clusters were high, high it stands for high performance, intensity, high performance, power, and then so on and so forth. So these are the Pareto filters and the champions. And then at the end of the statistical test, which we use cruise call values, certain compiler flags could pass within the threshold of 95% confidence level. You may wonder why, for instance, loop unrolling didn't pass, because if you look at here, loop unrolling was here around 10 to 20%, but since we wanted to have a robust outcome, we set the confidence level higher, so only these fours or fives could pass, and also the scalar uh, opti optimization could pass on certain clusters, not all of them. So that was why, for instance. And using these five, we could have a much, much lower design space, and using this smaller design space, as you see, the proposal optimization could outperform the VEX, which was the VLAW simulator, and LLVM2 and LLVM level, uh, optimization level 3, or all of the optimization turned on and all of the optimization turned off. So this will lead us to around 70 to 25% using the design space. All right, <clears throat> again, another dissemination. So the result of this has been published in IEEE uh, VNSI site in 2013, and these gentlemen were my co-authors. Now, let's go to the machine learning side, which we call it Cobain. Cobain stands for compiler auto tuning using Bayesian network. So another recap slide. As I mentioned before, iterative compilation stands for recompilation of source using different flags to satisfy different um, scenarios. So it's like somebody is trying to toss a coin for you and by each toss of the coin, you're going to have a new vector of optimization. You test that vector and you receive the results and then you <clears throat> put it in your DSP engine and then apply uh, a statistical test or machine learning or just leave it like this as a pure version and select the best one. The advantage is normally it brings good result in a good run because at the end, when you keep you know, tossing the coin and going on forever, you're going to beat whatever strategies that was there in the field, but it's going to take maybe years. And also, no machine intelligence needed on its pure version. But the downside is no knowledge transfer involved. The task is, of course, very high overhead and time consuming. So what we can do here? Can we do better? So of course, if we put certain intelligence within this approach, like machine learning intelligence or DSE, as what we did before, we can make this model to work and outperform the um, the other techniques that we have in the literature. That's why we use uh, Bayesian network. I'm not going to explain it that much because I'm running out of time. So Bayesian network is, is, is a very awesome machine learning tool for uh, characterizing cause and effect structures. So for instance, this is the cause and it is going to be the effect. For instance, uh, if it's, if it's going to rain tomorrow, whether uh, when we have certain clouds, something like that. So here could be the program component or characterization, and the second line could be optimization. And we understand that the cause and effect of within the programs and the optimizations, and we can you know um, <laughs> visualize it in a nice way. And definitely, the good point is it's going to be application specific. So based on whatever application we have, it's going to change. All right. So. The goal was to identify the best compiler flags. We did the classic uh, machine learning flow. At first, we characterized the space, characterized the application. Then we induced the, the model using those feature vectors. We generate the Bayesian network model. And at prediction, but in Bayesian network word, they call it inference. At inference time, we could infer the trained network based on uh, the applications under analysis, and that was the application-specific compiler flags. So again, at training, we have started this procedure, the characterizing, and we trained the model using the optimal solution, and at testing or prediction time, we use that model for target application, and then we generated the optimal solution based on the application under analysis. All right. 
as an example, so these are the component of the application or the principal component as we used PCA before. As you see, the Biogen network can relate the component of my application under analysis to different compiler optimizations. For instance, these were seven here. As you see, the blue line, uh, we can infer the knowledge that loop unrolling impacts on branch, branch probability or also this component is interdependent with three optimizations and the other three optimizations and that's why we understand that three optimizations are interdependent. So we could generate this for all the applications and data set and that's why our model can be inferred and these are these were the application under analysis and this was the speed up uh, the baseline which was 03 and in this case for nearly all of them we could outperform the standard optimization 02 and 03. The only case we missed that was consumer JPEG which on this uh, very rare occasion 03 was the optimal solution so we couldn't beat that. But on the other as you see we reach up to around 3x speed up for the applications. Okay this was another Result for Cobain, it shows that if we apply certain, if we put intelligence on our model, it can beat the iterative compilation at each step. So these black bars here are our performance, the Cobain performance, and the, the, the white bars are the iterative compilation performance. So you see at each step, like 5, 10, 15, we could outperform the iterative compilation because of having the intelligence within the model to keep generating better uh, solutions for us. So, and this one was the, it was scaled up to one as the optimal solution. All right, this is another way of representing the result using, this is called violin graphs. It's, it is showing the distribution, just like box plots. So as you see here, the, the moment we hit the same performance as a pure of iterative optimization, iterative compilation is to let iterative compilation to run for 32 times while we are using only eight extraction from our model. So this will lead us to 4x speed up regarding the exploration of space. So it's like when we explore one time, it's gonna take for iterative compilation four times of that to reach the same result. And this is insightful because in a long run, Eventually, we can be better. This was um, our comparison of Cobain with the best state-of-the-art model, which was introduced by Agakov at 2006. So their performance using these three different techniques, random, the, the IID oracle and the Markov chain oracle was within these three lines, and Cobain could outperform all of them within um, a clear margin of around 10%. So as uh, for the dissemination of these uh, results, at first we originally submitted to IEEE uh, Estimedia, which was within the embedded system week, and then the extended version has been accepted in ACM transaction on architecture and code optimization this year by the name Cobain, or compiler retuning using Bayesian network. So the, um, my co-authors were our postdoc here, the former postdoc Giovanni Mariani, who is an, in IBM, my colleagues in the US, and the gentleman, my advisors. All right, this will wrap up my selection problem. I'll have like a few slides for phase ordering because there were so many details I could go into, but of course we are running out of time, so I, I try to be as short as possible. So let's recap it again. That was the phase ordering problem. We don't have any ideal phase just like this, so we end up having a very huge design space. So there are two methods available in the state of the art or the literature, which is called intermediate speed up prediction or the full sequence prediction. So far, no literature as of now for that. So suppose you have a current status of your code. You have applied like your multi multiplication using loop unrolling. So you are in a state of transformed version to loop and rolling. If you use an intermediate speed up prediction, on that status or that state, 
the model will tell you what to apply next. So you're in transform version dash A, now using the model, I'll let you know that at this point you have to apply B. Then when you apply A and B at this level, that you are in the state A, B, I'll let you know to apply C, for instance. But full sequence prediction is a little bit harder task. So at one shot, it's going to let you know you have this application. This is the optimal solution. Use this. That's why it's a little bit harder to build and needs encoding to generate a fixed feature vector if you want to pass it to the machine learning. <clears throat> All right, first, we have started to initiate our research using intermediate speed up prediction with this methodology, as I explained before. So we train the model like this. So these are the pro program features. And this is the next optimization. Suppose till here, till here, your application has been applied with the next optimization, like loop unrolling. And then we're going to have the speed up of the previous version and the current version. And we're going to keep it like this. And we apply and we train the model at <coughs> the exploitation phase. When we have the uh, program features, it's going to let us know what's the next optimization to apply given your current state. And you're going to predict that speed up for you. In this way, we could run on certain applications of CBench, and these were the, the base phases. So each of them, so like C has a certain compiler flag inside, A is a group of compiler flag as well. So in order to show it better for you, I named them. So I, I named the subgroups into different names. So that was the best solution found, with or without repetition, and that was the speed up over the original version of the application. <coughs> In order to transfer, in order to explore, I'm sorry, in order to explore the, the space that on each side we have a prediction, so we have to explore within that uh, prediction vector, we need to have a policy. So we apply two different policies, greedy DFS or exhaustive prediction, and each of them lead us to certain speed up on average if you use harmonic mean. I was having 2% and 4% on different exploration. So as you see, we have a fairly hard, <coughs> uh, high error rate here, around 12% on our intermediate speed up prediction. But we put one step further and we, we tackled the phase ordering problem using a full sequence speed up predictor. We changed the way we have to train the model. We introduced a mapper here in order to map or encode our dynamic phase to a fixed lens feature vector. <laughs> and we clustered, we clustered our optimizations using a clustering technique. And in, in or, instead of having like 100 compiler flags at, at one shot, we clustered them into five or six clusters of 10 or 15. So that we use those clusters, which we already known that they can be working better in, instead of those you know, 100 compiler flags at one shot. And we train the model this way on the prediction phase, a target application comes, you, you characterize using its features, you apply whatever dimension reduction if you want, PCA or other techniques, so you have a reduced feature. Then you apply, uh, then, then your machine learning model comes and it's going to predict the speed up for you. Here, we, we use a little bit of the knowledge in the recommender system world. I'm, I'm, uh, I know that Professor Kermonesi is an expert on this field. So we use a little bit of recommender system uh, using adjusted cosine similarities in order to speed up a little bit our exploration with respect to using um, just greedy DFS or exhaustive exploration. Or another technique which is called ranking, which is the best state-of-the-art technique and I'll <clears throat> explain it in a minute. So, using that, we could reduce the prediction error to a high, to a much, much lower percentage instead of 12 using different um, machine learning models like MLP, linear regression, or K-star. You see these are the, 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 uh, the prediction error rate, which are much, much lower. So we had improve, if performance improvement of around 9%. So as you see, we had error rate improvement 
of around 5 to 7 percent with respect to the previous approach. This was the outcome of our result. We called it MyComp or Medicating Compiler Phase Ordering. So we named it MyComp. With respect to the ranking, which I explained like some minutes ago. So in the past, they used to generate the prediction vector, and then they were to rank it using the highest speed up, and they were using the first five, first one, or first 10 of those in order to compare. Like, I have a 1,000 in my vector, so I sort it by speed up, and I select the first one. The first one is called top one, and they would call it one sh the um, one-shot approach, or um, five-shot approach. So what the adjusted cosine similarity help us here is we use dynamic information across all the compiler sequences within the application data set we have, and it helped us to explore not just by a sort of speed up, which is a very static uh, feature, but we use dynamic information to explore and converge to the uh, more optimal point faster. So you see our top one approach finds us 1% speed up over the optimization O3, which, in which the, the setup of our techniques using the ranking could lead us to only 0.93 um, of the O3 speed up. And if you take a look at the trend here, we could always outperform the way the ranking work, and we could converge faster to better points in a design space. So the, the first one, the intermediate speed up, which I showed before, we submitted to ACM workshop of Palmer Ditam by this name. And the second work, which I showed right now, the MyCom, I submitted it around two months ago to ACM transaction on code optimization, and it's currently under review. So these gentlemen are my co-authors, um, <clears throat> that will lead me to finalize and conclude my dissertation. So as we explained in the past half an hour, uh, choosing what type of compiler flags and in what order of them is certainly a very hard problem. We need to have intelligence or using machine learning to apply and this non-deterministic uh, problem. So we definitely need better and more accurate machine learning model. Now we know that the deep learning era is going into the phase more and more using different layers of uh, you know, networks like neural network or convolutional neural network. So it's going to help us much more in order to build more accurate layers of models in order to <coughs> induce better results for us. Also, on the other side, we have to carry on working on the application characteristic, uh, characterization techniques. So in the past, we've been using graph-based features, or IR-based features, or, or hybrid features, which is a combination of the past two. But now we can even generate more accurate characterization from a source code in order to input it to a machine learning model. Of course, we need uh, multi-objective approaches, like uh, having to reach a parity curve of performance with respect to power efficiency, or applying some runtime optimization on that. On the other side note, polyhedral community, which I couldn't um, explain it due to lack of time, is a very nice recent uh, you know, approach to all the affine functions so that we can use the polyhedral model, which is a completely mathematical model, and it's, it's already been integrated in LLVM framework. So it's a very nice compiling infrastructure. It's good for the high performance computing era. So that's definitely one of the key points of compiler uh, guys in order to go for and tackle certain compiler optimization problems. By the introduction of heterogeneous word and HPC, we need to use more GPUs, so of course, we're going to have to shift our auto-tuning strategies from CPU to GPU application as well. So, these are some of my speculations for the near future. 
So it would be nice in the future that we come to the, to the point that we have more intelligent compilers so that they themselves can decide what to apply automatically on certain segments of the code. We have to use active learning at one time, which is a hard task. It needs fast and accurate model or supercomputers as well. And at the end, more interaction of industry and research community, for sure, will be more helpful. As a summary of what I've um, proposed and presented here in my dissertation, so on chapter two, we provided an extensive survey on the literature. On chapter three, we employed that design space exploration technique. On chapter four, we introduced the compiler optimization for selection problem. And on chapter five and six, we explored the, and tackled the phase ordering problem. I would like to thank um, the European Commission for, for partially funding my uh, PhD using these three fundings, and also the high pitch for uh, you know, granting me the collaboration grant, which made me able to go to uh, University of Delaware for seven months and I started uh, having connections with John Cavados and his group over there. So this is the wrap up for my publication. As I already mentioned, these two are under peer review right now. The third one has already been published in um, TACO. These are the two conference papers, 2013 and 14. And these two were the workshop papers. I had a bunch of posters, which I exclude them in order to save some time. I would like to thank all my colleagues and advisors. So on the left side, the colleagues in uh, Politecnico di Milano, Professor Silvano and Palermo, our previous postdocs. And also on the right side, the group of John Cavazos. And uh, so EJ, Marco, Samir, William, and also Robbie. And finally, thank you for your time. So any questions, welcome. So I, I will start with the first question about the Bayesian approach uh, in the sky. Uh, how long does it take the training? Well, it, it depends on the number of applications you want to have in your model. Uh, on, the, on the first, uh, let me see if I have something here. So on the first so on the um, paper we submitted, we only tackled C-Bench, which had, which had only 24 applications, and we used only uh, dynamic feature characterization, which is called a tool called Mika. And the training took, I would say, around seven days. But the testing was super fast. The testing was done in a matter of yeah, you know, seconds on prediction on each of the applications. If you increase the training set, of course, uh, as, as we did on the extended version when uh, we submitted to Transaction Taco, so we had to increase our characterization into three versions, so combining both approaches and a static analysis as well. So this will a little bit you know, extend the way the training was caused. Also, we applied on another bench set, which was called Polybench. So it had three, 30 more applications. So at the end, we had like 40, 45 applications. I think at the end, it took like 10 or 15 days on the extended version. But nevertheless, the, the prediction is done in a matter of seconds, like less than 30 seconds. Yeah, these were the benchmarks. Yeah, how, how, did you, how did you split the, uh, <coughs> the solution space uh, in between the training and testing? Well, uh, I, I was, since I was applying based on data sets as well, so each application had its own five or two data sets. So I was training using cross-validation and leave one out approach. So I was leaving one out and then I applied the training set for the rest. And when I wanted to infer or the prediction, I was using it as a test and the model was inferred based on that. Okay. <laughs> the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Yeah. Uh, the one you gave me would pass with the GPU reference at the very end. Um, one of the emerging uh, domains right now is uh, embedded GPUs. Okay. So my question has to do with uh, your future uh, plans to actually handle this. And then the second question, uh, we'll ask Paul so that everyone gets uh, the pass later. Um, have you considered um, simulating uh, and building more genetic algorithms for the optimization? 
genetic no because oh, yeah. oh, I don't know that. you know because uh, when I was studying the survey and the literature there were uh, very much I mean tons of works using genetic algorithm and I couldn't uh, basically come out come up with a robust solution how I'm going to be able to tackle and you know put one step further to contribute that's why I, I, I used Bayesian network which was perfectly fit for this domain and it was the first time but you know, if, if you take a look at uh, the, the chapter two, I think there are like 10 or 20 work already using genetic algorithm in the late 90s or early 2000s. And for the, your first question, of course, I mean, my plan for postdoc will be applying deep learning for GPU audit tuning. So definitely I'm looking forward for that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll be starting my postdoc from January in the University of Toronto. So my funding hasn't get confirmed yet, but I have the position so far. So. I've started the deep learning, um, uh, deep learning methodologies and tools on top of GPU application because this is the emerging. I mean, both on the embedded domain and on the HPC domain. What are you doing? Tarek Abdul Rahman. Yeah. So if there are no uh, okay. <laughs> so if there are no questions, uh, oh, there is also a question. Yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> I was surprised by the result for loop and rolling. Yeah. That's the typical thing you teach people. So that's exactly. The number one optimization you should do for VRW. That's right. So why? What well, well I, I was very, I was very suspectful as well for this. That's why I was taking a look at it as an extra step. So let me find it for you. Here. I was taking a look at the, the result of distribution. This is actually the loop and rolling, if I'm not wrong here. So you see, the different distribution of whether we disable or enable loop and rolling has a little bit of effect. Like you see, we have one distribution here and the other one here. But since we were using a robust uh, level of confidence level of 95, it couldn't get passed here. So there were, there were some changes, but not as tangible as we wanted to have. And at the, at the other point is, we were using VEX as a simulator, which has been introduced by HP Labs of really W. And um, maybe the simulator has something to do with this internal. I was double checking it. Everything on our side was correct. But the only thing that I can speculate is the point that it had some effects, but not as tangible as we could, you know, set the bar to the high confidence level of 95. That this will definitely help you. But yeah, loop and rolling is the, the most famous one for really WD, of course. So, so you use the back simulator for the text forever. Oh. I'm sorry? It, it takes forever to simulate. Yeah, of course. It takes forever to simulate. And <clears throat> I remember back in time, 2012 or 13, I was using it. Back then, LLVM used to have a source to source compiler, like two point, version 2.8. So we were using LLVM on its source source compiler, and we were passing the compiled version to the VEX, and then we were mapping it to the roof line. So here, if you see the, the, the loop here, so LLVM source source compilation using its opt version, and then VEX simulator applying the roof line model, apply the test, and then bring it back to the ZSC engine. It took forever, like maybe a month or so. I started in my master thesis, and it finished in my PhD, so. Maybe last one? Yeah. Uh, last one? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you discuss uh, micro architecture in development uh, optimizations. So, obviously, some are. Eliminating redundancy, of course, uh, has to be good. Many are not, but the ones you are finding, obviously, is not. Of course. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah. how you fit, how this fits. Yeah. Well, yeah. how you fit, how this fits yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I put an extra slide here at the end. Let's see. So it was, um, yeah, PIN. I mean, PIN is a very nice framework. It's been introduced by Intel. It's cross-platform within the Intel with the same ISA. It's a dynamic library. But the thing they haven't declared is we don't actually know that it has been declared as a cross architecture across the Intel architecture. But 
it depends if you want to have the PMCs or performance monitoring tool consider as a part of FISA or not. This will make a difference and some of the things are haven't documented. So if you take a look at the team, I mean, that was my famous um, quotation of a friend of mine in the US. He told me that ping is a kind of arrow. So he uses undocumented stuff. But we don't know exactly if you consider PMCs or the performance uh, monitoring counter as a part of ISA, for sure it's not going to be architecture independent. But nevertheless, I applied PIN on different architectures of Intel using different servers we had, and also on an embedded domain. It was working, so I could use my cross-platform cross, you know, results, and I was training on a device and testing on another device, so it was working. But yeah, I totally agree with you. Some of the things are not documented already, and you don't actually know that what's going to happen. Yeah. But nevertheless, for our extended result here, uh, where we submitted to Taco, we, we both pin tool as dynamic source of you know, characterization. Also, we use a static with the Milepost project. And also, we, we introduced a third one, which is called combined or the hybrid mode, as these two in order to offset the, the potential issues that PIN might have. Okay, so this is the PF. Thank you. Thank you.